What makes a human life go well? Which is to say, what do you need in order to live the good life? One obvious answer seems to be, well, pleasure! And this is the answer given by hedonists, some of whom we will now look at. The word hedonism usually has negative connotations. People think it means excess, or smut, or decadence, but that's actually not true. Evaluative hedonism is just the claim that pleasure and pain are the only things that are good in themselves. Everything else in the world is either good or bad, insofar as it produces one of these two. Hedonism goes right back to the ancient Greek thinker Epicurus, who was about as far from this idea of the decadent hedonist as you could possibly get. Epicurus thought that there were two types of pleasure, kinetic and catastomatic. Kinetic pleasure is the pleasure you get from satisfying some desire, like scratching an itch, eating, drinking, and having sex. Catastomatic pleasure is the fulfillment or the contentment that comes with not actually wanting anything more, of, of not having any more desires that could be satisfied. I'm just fine with what I've got, thanks very much. And catastomatic pleasure was what Epicurus prioritised. If you spend your time chasing kinetic pleasures, then you'll only get yourself anxious about whether or not you're going to achieve them. And their pleasure fades in time anyway, so in the end you'll just have a big hole where all your pleasures used to be. Whereas, if all your desires have been eliminated, then by definition you could not be any happier because there's nothing else that you want. You have no more desires that could be fulfilled. Fast forward a few thousand years to the next hedonist on our whistle stop tour, Jeremy Bentham. Bentham thought that all pleasures were of equal value, they only varied in terms of intensity and duration. Which didn't go over well with Victorian writer Thomas Carlyle, who thought that this was swine philosophy. Carlyle said that if pleasure is the only intrinsic good, then the life of a well-kept pig would be as good as, if not better, than the life of your average human. So everyone should prefer to be a pig pig, but we don't prefer that. We all prefer to be humans. Hence we arrive at John Stuart Mill and his book Utilitarianism, which contains an attempted answer to this pig problem. Mill said that some pleasures are higher than others, so the pleasures involved in being a human are higher than those involved in being a pig, hence we can say both that pleasure is the ultimate good and that we would rather be person than porcine. Fun fact, Mill was one of the first prominent British thinkers to advocate for the total legal equality of women. He also thought that a benevolent despotism was the best way for civilised nations to interact with barbarians, so what you gain on the swing is you lose on the roundabouts. How do we distinguish higher and lower pleasures? Well, Mill said you need to ask an expert. Ask somebody who has experienced two pleasures which they would prefer if they were offered in equal amounts. Whichever one they would go for, Mill said, is the higher pleasure. So pigs might well be very happy, but that's only because they've never experienced the joys of being human, whereas we humans can experience the joys of art and conversation and intellectual activity and all the joys that come with being a pig, like being warm and well-fed and having sex, and we would prefer a life that contained the human ones. But there's a problem with this. On what grounds will the experts decide? If they're offered two pleasures of equal amounts, and they make some non-arbitrary choice between them, then there must be something else of value entering the picture which informs their decision. We've departed from hedonism. We've given up on the idea that pleasure is the only thing that's intrinsically valuable, because now there must be something else entering the picture of value that enables the experts to make their decisions. And note that we only got this far because we accepted the core idea of hedonism, which is that pleasure is the only intrinsic good. Is that correct? Robert Nozick had a very famous challenge to this core idea of hedonism. Suppose that there was a machine that you could plug into that would stimulate your brain to make you think that you're living whatever kind of life you wanted. And when you're in the machine, you think it's the real world, but actually it's like a virtual reality matrix situation. And you forget while you're in there that you made the decision to live inside the machine. And suppose that someone's there to take care of your body while you're comatose as well. Suppose you could get more pleasure from your virtual life than you ever could from your real one, would you plug in? Or maybe a less loaded way of asking that question would be, would a life inside the experience machine be good? If you think that it would, then you don't have any intuitive problems with hedonism. But if you think that it wouldn't be a good life inside the experience machine, then maybe you would agree with Nozick's conclusion that there's more to the good life than just pleasure.
There's one more twist in the hedonism tale that we need to be aware of. Lots of very different experiences come under the umbrella term of pleasure. The pleasure of eating a delicious ice cream is quite different from the pleasure of listening to your favourite song, and it might seem difficult to say that those two quite different mental states are actually the same thing. So we need to say a little bit more about what pleasure is before we can say that the good life is full of it. Hence, Derek Parfit introduces preference hedonism, according to which pleasure just means any mental state that you want to be in. And that allows us to make it as broad as we like, and also to include things like masochism and the experience of watching a sad film as pleasurable. But the pig case and the experience machine and a few other cases still challenge this idea that pleasure is the only intrinsic good. Now, personally, I think that some form of preference hedonism is probably on the money. I think that it's correct, and I've written essays at university defending it. Although, of course, I'm just waiting for some argument to come along and change my mind. What do you guys think? Is pleasure what makes life good? Next time, we could either do what is fate, which is quite an easy one, or we could do how many objects are there, which is some pretty hardcore metaphysics. For more philosophical videos every Friday, please subscribe. This episode was sponsored by Scott Eichler, DJ McIsaac, Looking Glass Universe, Rich Clark, and a bunch of other people whose names are in the description. So thank you to all of you guys for sponsoring the show. And if you'd like to sponsor the show in exchange for rewards and shoutouts, then you can find me on Patreon. Last time we were talking about suicide and whether it's right to prevent someone from killing themselves, so minor trigger warning for the rest of the video. I want to say thank you to everyone who shared their experiences underneath that video and everyone who talked about it in a sensitive way and offered their support. You guys should really be proud of yourselves. One quick thing, the phrase committing suicide is a hang up from the days when suicide was a crime and it's seen as attributing a little bit of blame to people who do die in that way. A few people were using it, so if you go on to discuss suicide in other places, maybe consider being sensitive to that connotation and perhaps using a different phrase if that's not what you want to do. Okay, so let's see what you guys had to say. Mal Wursaw said we should just be utilitarian about this, and if someone killing themselves is going to decrease overall suffering, we should allow them to do that. Well, the trouble with that argument, and it's something that Glover, the philosopher we were discussing, actually points out, is that you can apply it in cases where somebody doesn't actually want to die. Once you get rid of autonomy, it's very difficult to get it back. Michael Constantine asked, well, why should we care about autonomy? That's a fair question. There are a few different answers you could give to that. You could be Kantian about it and say that being autonomous is just part of what it is to be a person. So if you are going to respect people of which you are one, you must respect their autonomy. Alternatively, you could say that when you disrespect people's autonomy, they suffer. People suffer when they don't get what they want. In fact, the preference hedonist would say that not getting what you want and pain are actually literally the same thing. And then, of course, you get into the issue of, well, which is going to have less less suffering here? That's a very, very good question. Well done for bringing it up. A few people said that contemplating or attempting suicide is always or usually a clear indication that someone isn't in their right mind, and therefore you can override that desire without impacting their autonomy because it isn't ever what they really want. But other people, for some reason particularly on Reddit, brought up examples of perfectly clear-headed people who do want to die. For instance, Japanese honor suicide. I'm disinclined to think that we can say that all cases of suicidal thoughts or behaviour, whether they have an underlying health condition partially responsible for them or not, can be swept aside like that and can be treated as if they are not desires that someone can have and reflect on and appreciate reasons for and against. So I'm not really sure we can just discount them all like that. John Peponis said that it is always wrong to kill oneself. Well, why? You talk in your comment about it being ethical to prevent suffering, what if someone killing themselves will actually result in less suffering overall? Ayami said that it is always good to save a life that wants to be saved, and therefore we get around this conflict between it being good to save a life and it good to respect people's autonomy. Well, that's a nice idea, but wouldn't that mean that it is not good to save the life of someone who is unconscious? Like, if you're in a coma in a burning building, is it good for me to save your life? Because you don't actually want your life to be saved. You don't want anything. You're unconscious. And you might well say, well, you know, they would want it if their brain was functioning as it normally functions, but then what would stop you from saying that in some of the other cases we were talking about where people don't have their brains functioning in the way they usually do? The Republic of Algeria tried to outline a legal process by which people could say as a matter of public record that they wanted to die and list their reasons for it so that there would be no ambiguity about whether they were giving consent and about whether or not it was what they really wanted. And that's an interesting and creative idea, I do quite like it. 
I guess someone could probably say in response that forcing someone to go on public record and state multiple times the reasons that they wanted to die, like in front of a police officer or something, might actually increase their overall suffering. Like, we know that people who have to give accounts of the trauma they've suffered in court, but causing them to relive that experience is actually quite painful. And also, I guess you might get people saying, oh, well, you know, I feel a little bit better today, but I've already started this whole legal process of me killing myself. I may as well go through with it now, because otherwise I'm just wasting everybody's time. That's all the time we've got this week. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye!